So are you already cold? Yes. It's freezing in here. Alright. Because let it be known that I didn't give you the blanket. You just took the blanket. I just took it because I walked in here and I can feel the chill. You know, just because you've now taken the blanket yourself, I'm tempted to turn the fan up. So. Maybe you should wear your hoodie in these videos. You don't have to look that professional. It's YouTube. They don't really care what they what you look like. They just they just care what your opinions are and why you're wrong about them. So it wasn't actually filming, was it? Oh yeah, it's oh. it's on. The microphone's not on though. Oh, I just haven't turned turned the microphone on yet. Now the microphone's on. <laughs> Now the audio sounds so much better. Oh, good. It's so cold in here that just off camera over there, Alex has got a side of beef, which he's keeping cold. It's it's really not even that... It's not that bad in here. It's 18 degrees outside, and I don't think it's much warmer in here. I don't know. I think you're just being a little... Over dramatic with your with with your blood thinners and such. So all right, here. Y and you know you were sitting next to a window, like for a while. Like it's, I don't know if it's necessarily in here. That's okay. You walk in here, you see your breath. So yeah, it's cold in here. Ah, eh, I don't know. Anyway, <sighs> hey guys, it's Alex and Dad from Seventh Hour Films back again with Doctor Who Classic. Last time around, we started off the Time Monster. What was that one about? Now, the Master yes. has somehow managed to open up a rift in time and space, and there's a chronovore, something that literally eats time and space, that he's trying to bring forth into our universe and it's all connected with the Greek gods and Atlantis somehow and it it was somewhat jumbled up but uh, we're assuming, you know, it was interesting we were trying to figure out where it was going but we have no idea where it's going. So we're kind of hoping that these last three or four episodes will kind of pull it all together for us. Yeah, so uh, the, the master yes, he has brought forth this uh, bird dude named Kronos I forgot the bird dude. Yeah. <laughs> and he wants to use Kronos to take over the universe because he could destroy the universe if he wanted to. Obviously, it's the master playing with fire again and how well that will work out, we don't know. But uh, the doctor and unit are trying to uh, thwart his plans. And I think uh, where we last left off, the master was about to go back to Atlantis with uh, the priest yes. that he brought forth. So Crassus or something like that. Something like that, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think also uh, the Master was also, uh, in order to attack Unit, was bringing in stuff from time. So there was uh, a knight on a horse, and then there was, what was it the Roundheads? Was, is what yes, they were the called? Roundheads from yeah. the uh, English Civil War. Yeah, and then a V1 yes. from, uh, World II. from World War Two. And that was sort of the last place we left of, oh, maybe Mike Yates is dead. He's probably not, but, you know, a good cliffhanger. So, yeah, uh, this is the end of the season, these last three episodes. Next week, uh, we'll be re-watching The Three Doctors. That was kind of fun. Yeah. Although it was kind of sad that Hartnell was basically, you know, obviously filming in a one little uh, set, and it was projected yeah. on TV. But, uh, yeah, it was interesting, the interaction between uh, Troughton and Pertwee. Uh, my favorite thing, of course, <coughs> and you told me that they do this quite a lot whenever the doctors meet, is the first time uh, Troughton walks into the TARDIS, he looks around and goes, oh, I see you've redecorated. I don't like it. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, we'll be re-watching that. It'll be a four-parter, uh, which we, I don't think, has there been a single four-parter all season? I think they've all been six parts, so... Uh, sea Devils was six. Curse of no, Curse of Peladon was four, and then Day of the Daleks was uh, four as well. Interestingly, here on Amazon, a they still say it all aired on December thirty first, December thirty first, nineteen seventy one, which we have 
uh, figured out is false. They also don't put the episode numbers on, on it. It's just Day of the Daleks. So, anywho, that's weird. Fix that, Amazon. Why don't you? Um, but anyway, so because uh, the, the Three Doctors is actually the last rewatch of the Pertwee era. So, um, we are still going to be doing a modern episode. I still have not fully decided what we're going to do. If we're going to uh, go with what you've requested, which is the first episode of Eccleston's era. Or if we'll go with something else. Or both. I don't know. Maybe we'll do both. Uh, because I know uh, the particular episode that I'm thinking of, other people have uh, sort of been excited for it. So, who knows. Maybe we'll do both. Or we'll just do another uh, when we get around to the first rewatch of a Tom Baker episode, we'll just get to that one. Okay. So, uh, we'll decide. Uh, but that'll be next week. In the meantime, we do have the Time Monster to get to. So, you got anything else? I got nothing. Then let's just go ahead and get started. Here we go. One, two, six, eight. One, two, six, eight. Maybe that's the British way of counting. Oh, oh that's gonna give us a whole lot of comments. <laughs> Boy, it's interesting. All the round things are real. Human. Yeah. This looks different. Oh, this is for a redecoration. That's all. No. Glad to have you aboard, Miss Grant. Glad to be aboard, Doctor. <laughs> Have you ever seen it disappear before? Londoners. <laughs> um, I don't think so. I think the the brigadier has just sort of walked out, come back, and it's gone. Yeah. So. I love that nothing phases the British. Well, they have been around for quite a long time. <laughs> Dear, oh dear, oh dear. I think you got it the other way round. Still, Joe, you wait right here. Good grief. <laughs> Joe. Hmm. I, uh, I see the problem. They won't stop me now. Sorry, Professor, but that's where you're wrong. Oh, he's got a gun. You suit yourself, mate. But let's just have those hands up in the air, shall we? But just shoot him. Shoot him. Yeah, I the brigadier would have shot him. You while I had the Stuart, watch out! Oh, oh. Good job, guys. Martha, you told me he was safe in there. Once he realizes that he's talking to himself, he'll be out here like a shot. Ah! He's realized it at last. That took a long time, a slow-witted fool. Now you watch. He cannot bear not to have the last word. Well, that's not good. It's made no difference. They're still stuck. We keep playing the same musical sting from a Christmas story. Nothing happened at all. Nothing? Oh no. Oh no, it's like Ant Man. Master, what is he doing? All the low underhanded tricks. No. What language was that? English. English? Yes, but backwards. No. Don't get it. <laughs> Eternity of nothingness. <laughs> it's a coin of phrase, a living death. <laughs> Eventually he stopped thinking. Goodbye, Miss Grant. <laughs> All righty. Certainly action-packed. 
Yeah, definitely. That's, uh... There's a very interesting effect of splitting the two TARDISes there. Yeah. Um, yeah, the interesting stuff. The I will say, it is still a slight shame, and I know we're talking about uh, a budget of less than a ham sandwich, <laughs> but that costume is not the most convincing. But they're keeping it off screen yeah. enough to where it's not that bad. Yeah. So. And again, if they would just show the flapping wings and not the, the face, which is... So, you know, obviously, you know, some kind of very rigid, you know, mask. If And again, they, they did that originally when you just barely were able to see it. But when they show it full on like that, that's where it loses its credibility. Well, yeah. So, you know, this also seems like something where the Doctor would call the Time Lords. Like, especially because we had that in the war games. Like, oh, this is, you know, this is too much. I need to call in the Time Lords to fix all of this. Like... You'd think he would do that now. Although, I mean, could they do more? I don't know. Because there's a point where it's like, well, no, they keep sending the Doctor do, to do all this stuff because the Time Lords, they don't really get involved in this sort of stuff. But then I think back to the War Games, and it's like, no, that was terrifying. <laughs> so, I'm not sure. Goodbye, Miss Grant! Now, I have to say, the uh, actor playing Crassus who's literally standing around just reacting, is doing very well. I mean, he's not well, yeah. distracting, he's, but he is completely focused on what the Master's doing. Yeah. Hello, Joe. Well, that worked out. <laughs> Meanwhile... Now this set looks classic. I wonder if any part of this was used with the uh, myth makers. Maybe. Don't specifically know if the Greeks would have had African bearers there. Hmm. I almost said Paul bearers, but. Holiness, the most venerable priest Maybe his name is Paul. King of the Ten Kings. Council is as a man. The king departs. Song trumpets. Gotta say, really accurate costumes, especially hers. Mm. There is a Minoan statuette almost identical to that with what I told you last week. Of course, the one difference is she would have been bare breasted. You will. Elementary technique of fascination. I have nothing more to say to you. You have said nothing to me yet. When you find the true word to speak, I will listen. I like this guy. Can't think of anything to say. How about curses foiled again? <laughs> <laughs> Again, the sets and the costumes are just fantastic. Even looking out behind the Master and the King, there was that, you know, cliff with the uh, Parthenon-like building on it, that temple. It was very, very well done. Well, and for only, like, two episodes of this story. Strangers are uncommon in our land. Who are you? This is Joe, Joe Grant, Your Majesty. You are welcome, Jojo Grant. <laughs> Surely, as an ancient, take the Lady Jojo Grant to the Queen <laughs> while I talk with this, uh... Oh, this is the Doctor. This learned man. Now, I don't know if it's the writing that's better in this yes, episode or just that Jogurant. that actor playing the king. He's really good. Well, yeah. But his face, Luckis, it was a face of power. A man with such a face would dare risk the world to win his own desire. Hip, yes, it's better. Well, she's beginning yeah. to look very familiar. And a foolish one, no doubt, to trust a queen. Foolish, certainly. To think himself man Notice enough a couple to love times a queen. The shadow of the no, Luckis. boom microphone. Come back. She and her companion fell from the skies, as did the master. It's the day of wonders. I can say that again. Why should I say it again? <laughs> I knew Galea once, you see. The woman, not the queen. A sweet and loving lady. I took you for her. Please do forgive me. You may go. I thank you, lady. Uh, intrigue at the royal court. 
Well, I was gonna say, we have a... We are working on another plot. We don't need Atlantean soap opera, too. Help me to find a way to stop these evil men. Help me to save Atlantis from destruction. Well, I can only promise you one of those things. Where is she? No, you mustn't go in. You mustn't. Look, I'll be as quiet as a... Do they have mice of Atlantis? Yes. Well, that's what I'll be as quiet as. An Atlantean mouse. Okay. I mean, the cat's gotta eat something. Not without right my... Right now, cat. I have a constant short story to tell you. Alright. Um, would you not see her restored to her former glory? Rich, powerful, magnificent among the nations of the world? <laughs> Who would not be ruler of such a country? I see Nothing he's using an older hypnosis. form of hypnosis. <laughs> He's really good. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Ingrid Pitt. <laughs> going to sound weird. She did a lot of really bad, like, B-movie horror stuff in the late 60s and 70s. Um, I, I saw a couple of uh, those things uh, that she was in when I was in high school and in college. Um, I want to say she did something that was kind of a ripoff of the Dracula story, but she was like the female version of Dracula. Hmm. Well, that wouldn't be Carmilla, because Carmilla's its own story, so. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, she, like I say, she's like queen of the B-movies. Hmm. Uh, uh, and a lot of the, you know, Peter Cushing and, and the Hammer films and stuff like that, if I recall correctly. So maybe it's a step up to be on Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, Do Doctor Who... Nobody take any offense to this, but some of you might, is that Doctor Who may be the, the B-movie of, like, stream, mainstream sci-fi. Like, if you've got your Star Trek and your Star Wars, like, they, then you've got your, especially classic Doctor Who. Now, this is after Star Trek, yeah. which had already gone off the air, and uh, remember, in the early 70s, uh, nobody thought much of, of Star Trek. You know, it was yeah. a, a B-movie science fiction thing. On American television, although it, it was running uh, on British TV by this time. Uh, this is before the big phenomenon of the movies and then the next generation. Uh, as far as I know, again, no other major sci-fi on British television at this time. So I would think, uh, the, especially the fact that this is, what, and it's now ninth or tenth season, this yeah. was probably the, you know, A-level science fiction of the time. Honestly, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. Um, because even... Even just the fact that it keeps going, you know, like this is the end of season nine of 26. And then, yes, there is a bit of a gap between, you know, 1986 and 2005. But eventually then it comes back and they've been pretty consistent since then. Yeah. Whereas even like, you know, Star Trek, you have that huge gap between the original series and then the next gen. And then you have that giant gap between Enterprise and Discovery and you wish that gap had kind of kept going and stuff. So, um, and even Star Wars has the same thing going on between the original trilogy and then the the prequels and Clone Wars and now what we have uh, going on today. So, honestly, Doctor Who's probably been more consistent than the others. Yeah. So, yeah, you're probably right that it, this is a bit more A tier. Yeah. It's just a far lower budget than the others. Yeah. So, but it, it uses that to its advantage. And I'm very curious if they're actually going to show a minotaur because i i don't know they the fact that they haven't shown the actual thing kind of makes me think maybe they'll kind of keep it off screen to yeah. sort of save money which is fine yeah um and that might even work out better um it is honestly one of those things where it's like we have one episode left of this story it feels like we should have two <laughs> because we just introduced so much stuff of atlantis and the king yeah. and the queen and hippias and everything that it's like oh yeah we were still this is a story about the master, and he's bringing forth this monster, and we had unit and everything. So now I will say this: in my opinion, this episode confirms what I have always said. Because they had access to the BBC's costume department and props and everything, when they do the true historicals, those were the best ones. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, and I'm, I know science fiction is all about, you know, predicting the future and this. But for a time travel show, one of your staples should be going back to things that people know. When we say we're going back to Atlantis and you show them all this stuff. And school children in Great Britain, because I know uh, we did it here. You know, when I taught world history, I taught them all about ancient Greece and the story of Atlantis. You know, as much as sixth graders need to know about Atlantis and, you know, Plato and Socrates and all the rest of that. But uh, the point is... They would have had some reference. They would look at this and go, oh, this is cool. I learned about this in, you know, whatever, I guess whatever, you know, 12 uh, or 13-year-old. Uh, again, I, I'm not familiar with the British school system, but I, I'm pretty sure that British kids would have known about ancient Greece, just like they would have known about the Romans and even about the American Civil War and things like that, like we saw in the war games. Yeah. So this is, this is their strength, and I'm sorry they ever got away from this. Yeah. I hope that, because I think pretty soon we're coming up on the TARDIS being fully functioning again, and then we're going to sort of move away from UNIT, and we're going back up into, uh, uh, throughout time and space and stuff. I hope it does sort of become more of a mix, even if it is like, this alien is trying to destroy Carthage or something. Yeah. Like, well, you still have Carthage there, yeah. you know, like, because that's also the thing here. It's like, all the stuff with Atlantis is great, and you have the master on top of that, so... Um, so yeah, hopefully we get a bit more, uh, time travel, so. Oh. That's not bad. No. This is a giant bullhead on a buff dude, but it works. Ha, ah, you got both of them. Good job. And now he's gonna hurt his tailbone. Ooh! That's a bane. <laughs> Good job. I mean, yeah, his entire outfit is red, too. I'm glad that came back. Well, when I was a little boy, we used to live in a house that was perched halfway up the top of a mountain. Hmm. And behind our house, there sat under a tree an old man, a hermit, a monk. He lived under this tree for half his lifetime, so they said, and learned the secret of life. So, when my black day came, I went and asked him to help me. Ah, I'll never forget what it was like up there. All bleak and cold it was. A few bare rocks with some weeds sprouting from them. And some pathetic little patches of sludgy snow. It was just grey. He just sat there silently, expressionless. And he listened whilst I poured out my troubles to him. He lifted a skeletal hand and he pointed. Do you know what he pointed at? No. A flower. Well, I looked at it for a moment. And suddenly I saw it through his eyes. It was simply glowing with life. Like a perfectly cut jewel. And the colors. But the colors were deeper and richer than anything you can possibly imagine. Yes, that was the daisiest daisy I'd ever seen. <laughs> so later I got up. And I ran down that mountain. And I found that the rocks weren't grey at all. They were red, brown, purple and gold. You still frightened, Jim? No. Not as much as I was. That's mm. good. I'm sorry I brought you to Atlantis. That was an interesting story. Out of my way, slave! <laughs> Talis, is the master responsible for this? What do you think? We won't fail you, Dalius. Yeah, you'd think after 500 years that wouldn't have been the way he went out, but... Oops. They're out of there. Oh, well, bye. Good luck with that.
Uh. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> that is a funky effect. I mean, you're dead too, and so is the master. I suppose we're all in heaven. Yeah, or somewhere. Hey, come take a look. Well, it's definitely not Kansas. <laughs> I think this is the 70s. Mm -hmm. Ah! Greetings. I can't quite place you. I am him. You? But you're a girl. A shape of nothing. But a little while ago you were a, a raging monster and an evil destroyer. I can be all things. A destroyer, a healer, a creator. I'm beyond good and evil as you know it. So why a bird? He is no. What will happen to him? Torment, of course. Thank you, Doctor. Don't thank me. You're coming back to Earth with us. Yes, of course. You're being arrested again. Well, I suppose that he given his freedom. He has it. Here we go again. Come on, oh, yeah, Benton. Come on, get you down. <laughs> the poor guy. <laughs> To do. Kid's like 50 years old now, isn't he? Would you condemn anybody to an eternity of torment, even the master? No. No, I guess I wouldn't. No. Well, neither would I. Even though he was responsible. And they're better people than I am, I think. <laughs> I might have done it. <laughs> and well, I'm taking Sergeant Benson. The baby. We forgot the baby. Can somebody please mind telling me exactly what's happening around here? <laughs> oh. At least they didn't do the laughing freeze. Meh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, poor Benton. Oh, well. Well, the master has gone away again. So. Um, I think... I think there may be one more story with him. Obviously, it's not next episode, because next one is the three doctors. But I think there's at least one more with the Master. So we will enjoy it when we get to it, I'm sure. Um, kind of an, a, a strange conclusion, but I mean, where do you go from there, I guess? Yeah. Now, I was kind of surprised that they didn't show more of the destruction of Atlantis. Yeah. Because there are some scenes from, and again, I'm pretty sure that film was in the early 60s, uh, that they could have shown, you know, just some standard clips uh, of the island sinking below the water, you know, which is where we end up thinking of it. Yeah, or even like, you know, do some model work and that could, you could probably get it, so. Um, but yeah, I was not expecting a true version of Kronos or... Something, so I, I guess we're cool. I, I guess it's fine. Well, it, it, again, the fact that she appeared in a semi-human form there at the end seems to me that they could have done less with the flapping bird costume and done something just, uh, again, more amorphous, you know, just a, a blob of light with you know, uh. the, the occasional maybe hand or something coming out of it to be menacing. But the bird costume just was... That's probably the weakest link in the entire six parts. Yeah, so. Alrighty. Well, to jump into the notes, the first thing I wrote down is the two TARDISes inside of each other, uh, which was an interesting sort of visual gag. Of you go in one door, you're in the other, and then you walk out, and then you're in the other. So uh, <laughs> they did that. There was a, a mini episode with the 11th Doctor where something went wrong, and the exterior of the TARDIS was inside of the TARDIS. So they went over to the door, you know, stuck your hand through, and there it is coming through the box. <laughs> so uh, I don't remember, like, how it was some sort of weird timey-wimey thing of fixing it. But, <laughs> but yeah, it is sort of that same thing. Um, I, I did write down, shoot him, that Benton did not shoot yeah. him. You know, after two seasons of The Master... You think you would at this point. Yeah. So he's done so much. I mean he he's literally guilty of attempted murder on several occasions. Yeah. Can't remember if he's actually killed somebody. 
but you would be justified in at least wounding him. You shoot him in the leg or something just to make sure that he doesn't get away. Yeah. So, and I mean, that is sort of one thing with like, uh, I, I guess just sort of fiction and cinema in general where it's like, oh no, we can't just shoot him and kill him. And it's like, well, you could shoot his leg. And then even if it's like, you know, you have to patch him up so that, you know, he doesn't bleed out. But it's like, shoot the leg, maybe shoot the foot, shoot both of his kneecaps. Yeah. There you go. Now now he's not going to get around. Sweep the leg. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, it, there are ways. A gun is not just a straight, you know, instant kill machine. Yeah. It can be if you hit the right thing. But, you know, don't shoot the head. Go for the kneecaps. Go for the feet. Do something. Yeah. So incapacitated. Yeah. So uh I did like that the master was banking on the doctor going into his TARDIS just to have the last word. So uh I thought that was funny that he will he will have the last word in whatever conversation he's in. So uh so that was fun. And then there was also the whole thing of speaking backwards. Um which this finally establishes the whole thing of uh the TARDIS being telepathic, I think. Yeah. I don't remember if they've said that uh, I don't beforehand. think so either. Yeah. yeah, so... And I'm sure all they did was they simply recorded uh, Pertwee's lines and then just played them back on tape. The The Beatles had been doing that in a lot of their music in the late 60s. Yeah, so... Um, now, I think uh, people have said that it's not really established in classic Doctor Who that the TARDIS is this universal translator. I think that is more of a new Doctor Who thing. Um, I don't know if maybe it was implied or something, but that at least starts the whole thing, you know? And we get the, the I guess, re reaffirming that the TARDIS is alive. Yeah. So, uh, so that was pretty good. Uh, let's see. Well, we did have the Doctor being thrown into the time vortex, but that was fixed pretty quickly. At, at first, I was kind of thinking, like, oh, he's just sort of, you know, he's off screen and we only hear his voice. And it's like, you know, this feels like something from back in the day where it's like, well, you know, Hartnell has the week off, so we have to do something to get around that. <laughs> um, it it kind of felt like that, but then obviously it was fixed immediately. Yeah. And they don't really do that anymore. No, well, uh, didn't you say that uh, at some point, was it was it with Pertwee, or did they do it, start doing it with uh, Troughton, where instead of going, you know, 48 or 52 weeks out of the year, they only did half a year. And yeah. that way... That you know they had six months off, like we do with regular television nowadays. Right. I I think they were starting to do less with uh, with Troughton because I remember it was, I think it was about seven stories in his last season. Although I think a lot of them uh, ran for more episodes. Obviously, the last one was ten parts. I think that also had the invasion, which was eight. Whereas all of these are either four or six parts, and this is story five. Yeah. So. Uh, and I think they've all run, I think maybe season seven was four stories, then five and five for eight and nine. So, um, so yeah, they are doing it more like traditional modern television as opposed to back in the day with Hartnell where it's like, no, there's a new episode literally every week. Yeah. So, um, which is ridiculous that they pulled that off, especially with him too. Yeah, but uh, oddly enough, that was... Uh, very popular. Uh, again, uh, I recall uh, there was a uh, British uh, evening soap opera called Coronation Street. And if I recall correctly, they did two episodes a week. Hmm. But here in the United States, the afternoon soap operas, they did five episodes a week every week of the year. Yeah. I mean, now granted, maybe to their credit, they're not doing the special effects of doctor who even yeah. uh even you know compared to other shows uh of the time but like but yeah if you're doing a soap opera maybe but that's still a lot of episodes yeah. now i will say this um either in 68 or 69 uh somebody put on a new american soap opera uh called dark shadows and initially it was about you know just this you know, creepy old mansion up in new england somewhere and it it was you know just standard you know, Agatha Christie type stuff. Uh, it was more dramatic than the average, you know, uh, everyday soap opera. And it wasn't doing very well. And then a couple of months in, they decided to introduce the character of Barnabas Collins, who turned out to be a vampire. And when they introduced him, that soap opera shot up to number one, and they said, okay, what else can we do? And then they introduced the character, Quentin, who was a werewolf. 
and then Angelique, who was a witch. And so for four or five years right there in the late 60s, early 70s, Dark Shadows was the number one, and they had to do the mm. kind of special effects. But again, that was on five days a week. That's insane. Yeah. Because I remember when we did uh, Dimensions in Time, which is the EastEnders crossover, hilarious uh, uh, episode, by the way, and that reaction was just fun. Um, but I remember like looking up, and it's like, EastEnders, like 5,000 episodes or so. Yeah. So, and... And also just the fact that they still like have some consistent actors like through yeah. all those years. Yeah, kids so. go on as teenagers and end up you know being the sixty and seventy year olds on there because they literally spend their entire yeah. life doing that. Which I mean, it's probably a good gig, honestly. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have no idea what the filming schedule is like for a show that airs five days a week. But what's really odd is a lot of times they will film like two weeks worth of episodes in a single week. Uh, and then they'll give the the actors some time off, but they they usually uh, actually show them kind of like you do two weeks after they've been recorded. Yeah. So, and I'm also just curious, like, how do you keep the writing going for that? Like, you know, like I'll, I'll watch like behind the scenes for like Breaking Bad and stuff like that, and they have this you know entire writers room where they're trying to figure out all right, so what would Walt do? What would Jesse do? How does this work? And they're trying to evolve the characters and stuff like that. Imagine doing that but instead of like well we have like a 13 episode season it's like no five episodes every week forever no yeah. breaks yeah 250 episodes a year yeah now, a lot of times uh, and having never worked on a soap opera or anything but i have uh, i have studied some of them a little bit um they instead of writing entire pages of dialogue they will simply write a scene and then say to the actors who you know have inhabited these characters for years, you know what your character would say in this scene. So here's where we need you to start the scene. Here's where you, you need to get to the end, and just kind of improvise the dialogue in between. And if it doesn't work, we'll go back and try it again. Uh, but most of the time, again, because these characters, the, the actors are the characters, they just blaze right through it. Yeah. So, and I would imagine there's not too many takes. Like you have yeah. different takes because that was always the thing. Uh, it, even like with Star Trek and probably the same thing on Doctor Who where it's like if the first take is good enough it's good enough we move on yeah. we have you know we've got work to do we've got episodes to churn through yeah. and especially in Star Trek where yeah it's like 20 something odd episodes which I guess it's the same thing here yeah. but they're it's also shorter episodes on here uh, have you ever seen the film Tootsie I don't think so okay you'll need to watch that uh, it's about uh, an American actor who has he's he's a really good actor but he's off stage he's got this really kind of annoying personality and every time he goes up for a part nobody wants to work with him and so he finally decides that he's going to dress himself up as a woman so he you know shaves and puts on the makeup and the wig and the, the bodysuit and everything and he goes in and he gets a part in a soap opera and becomes the star of the soap opera and a lot of what goes on backstage and even during the taping uh, is is in that film so that will give you a kind of a a comedic insight as to what goes hmm. on in those. It sounds like that Ed Wood movie. Yeah. What was it? Glenn or Glenda? Glenn or Glenda, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is that, but it also has Bela Lugosi like, and stock footage of random animals and stuff. Yeah. We are so off topic. <laughs> but but okay. still. Anyway, uh, but uh, Dustin Hoffman stars as the as the woman. Hmm. All right. Um, anywho. Uh so yeah, all of that conversation stemmed from the time vortex that the doctor was thrown into. Um, and then we did actually go to Atlantis, which, again, it seems like almost a shame that they build such grand sets for Atlantis to only be in two episodes, yeah. really. You know, like, we could have done an entire story here, basically. Yeah. Though I wonder if maybe some of these were, you know, you said maybe they're uh, from, like, the Myth Makers and stuff. I would almost wonder if they were slightly reused from uh, the Curse of Peladon because that was earlier this season. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it could be something like that, um, and also included with these, you know, this really quick introduction of Atlantis and this Atlantean set is this whole, uh, ironically, soap opera that we have going on <laughs> between uh, Dalios, uh, his wife Galia, and then Hippias, which is interesting. Yeah. It's like there is an entire backstory. That we frankly cannot get to because we have other work we have to do. This is a Doctor Who episode. Yeah. But, yeah, there's... 
obviously this history between Hippias and uh, Galia and everything, but we just don't have the time for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but still, it was interesting. I mean, at, at the very least, just hinting at it does make these characters all the more memorable. Yeah. So. And what's really kind of cool is that Hippias would have been a name, uh, if I recall correctly, in Greek, uh, meaning horse-like, you know, because a, uh, the horse was a uh, hippo. The hippopotamus, of course, gets its name because it's literally a water horse. But in the 70s, there would have been the just the alliteration of, well, this guy's a young man with long hair and he doesn't you know follow the standards, so he's probably a hippie sort of thing. So I don't know, maybe that's what yeah, they were thinking. Yeah, maybe. Um, you made me write down cat. Oh, yeah. Uh, you were uh, saying the cat uh, because obviously there were Atlantean mice or something like that. Yeah. But that ties into something that Hippias said in the in that first throne room scene where he talked about how uh, the granaries would be empty. Uh, and that's what prompted me to, to have you write that down. Uh, one of the reasons why the ancient Egyptians revered cats so much and even had one of the goddesses of the Egyptian pantheon, uh, Bastet, was part woman and part cat, is that, uh, as you may have probably forgotten from your world history class, the Egyptians were able to grow huge amounts of wheat, wheat there along the Nile, except in the years of the drought. But they were very far-sighted when they grew surplus wheat, rather than necessarily trading it to the Greeks or to you know the, the uh, Mesopotamians, they would store it in granaries because it lasts for years without going bad. And so in the years of drought, they would open up the granaries and feed the entire kingdom with the stored grain. But the big problem with that, of course, is anytime you store large amounts of grain, it's going to attract vermin like rats and mice. Yeah. So the Egyptians had to have cats to keep away the vermin so that they would be able to feed themselves in times of, of drought. Hmm. And famine. So it's just that there's a whole wonderful little interconnection there of yeah. why these ancient uh, peoples love cats so much is because cats literally kept them alive by keeping their grain safe. Yeah, wasn't there? And I think this was like a war with Egypt where like their enemies were like catapulting cats. Yes, that now that was uh, somewhat later on. Um, that was the Persians. It was either the Persians or, or Alexander's uh, group, yeah, where they rode in and the town had fortified itself behind walls, and so they they literally went out and grabbed all the cats they could find. I even uh, have a, a painting of that where it shows the chariots running around the walls of the city, and the guys in the chariots have got one driver, and the other guys literally just picking up cats and throwing them over the wall. And of course, the Egyptians panic because you know these were their their gods or you know the f familiars of their gods. Uh, and I can't remember the name of the battle, but I'll, I'll try to remember to find that picture for you somewhere. Yeah, so, and honestly, it, it, it makes sense, honestly, if you're going to choose any animal to be a god. A cat does make sense, because they would like to decide if you live and die. They are that callous about <laughs> humanity. So, now a dog, they are happy enough to keep you around, but they are more, you know, the best friend and stuff like that. Yeah. Bump the table. Uh, they are more of the best friend, where the cat is like, no, 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 no. You work for me. Yeah. So the, uh, of course, the uh, dog-like animals in Egypt were not the kind of dogs that we have today. Yeah. Uh, they would have been the jackals, which of course led to Anubis being the jackal-headed god, because when the Egyptians, before the mummification process started, when they would take their people out and bury them in the sand out in the desert, and they would come back, you know, a few weeks later to, you know, pay respects or you know, put flowers. They would always see the jackals around where the uh, uh, the grave had been and then they realized that the person's body had gone and they assumed that the jackals had helped the body ascend to you know heaven or the, you know the other plane and so that's when they began to associate the jackal with the life after death and that's again how Anubis got his shape yeah and with all this talk about Egypt, while well, we're talking about an, an, an episode with Atlantis, I am thinking of every piece of media that has ever used Egypt and how I don't know if there's that many that are actually that good. Like, there's some, like, you know, The Mummy is pretty fun where it has Imhotep and everything. But then I think about, you know, this is a coin for you, not for the audience, but thinking about Yu-Gi-Oh!, which uses, you know, the Egyptian god cards. And in the first movie, the villain is Anubis and everything. And then I'm thinking of uh, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, which 
kind of eventually uh, the the main villain Dio. He's a Victorian British vampire in the eighties who goes to Egypt. It's a whole thing, but uh, some of his minions, their stands, their powers are named after the different Egyptian gods, uh, but they're not supposed to be like related in any yeah. way. And then I thought of Gods of Egypt, which was a terrible movie, horrible film. Yeah, and then it's and I was just sitting here like, is there anything like good, like a good piece of media related to Egypt other than like the Mummy? Uh, no, the, uh, they are they're hard to come. Well, of course, the Ten Commandments. Uh, yeah, yeah, Yul Brynner as uh, as the Pharaoh. Right. Um, but yeah, a lot of them are are not. But there's here's the thing. There are so many wonderful stories there. I mean, you've got the story of uh, Hatshepsut, the first nominally queen uh, of Egypt, the first female uh, pharaoh, uh, and how she came to power and what she did for them. you got the uh, uh, story of how uh, the Egyptians had been conquered uh, by the, uh, the hill people, the uh, Hyksos, uh, and then, oh, I can never remember his name, I think his name was Akmos, the first pharaoh of the New Kingdom, who literally rallied the people to drive them out because after serving the Hyksos for more than 100 years, they literally learned all their secrets. You know, they literally groveled in front of the Hyksos and said, you know, you have beaten us because you have so much different technology and, you know, learned how to make uh, iron and how to make weapons of iron and how to make chariots and all that other stuff. And then once they had gained all the technology, then they rose up and said, look, we now have your technology. There's, you know, a hundred thousand of you, but there's a hundred million of us, or however many, and so they just swept them out. So I mean, there's just it's it's ripe for storytelling and movie making, and you know what do we get? We get Yu-Gi-Oh. That well, yeah. I mean, because like you you get the Ten Commandments, which is good, and you get Prince of Egypt, which is good, and then you get what was it? Exodus, Gods and Kings with Christian Bale, which was okay at best, and then you get you know, the mummy, I guess go all the way back to the Boris Karloff version then you get the mummy with Brendan Fraser which is good and fun, and then you get the mummy with Tom Cruise, and that just sort of falls apart yeah, I haven't seen that one Yeah, it's I I don't know if I've seen the full thing, but it's not it's not good, they're trying to set up their monster universe and stuff that f bombed immediately yeah. Um, but yeah, and at least <laughs> If I can defend Yu-Gi-Oh! slightly, they're at least... It's not that they're butchering old stories. It's that they're making a new story. That's They're trying to be separate and stuff. And it, We'll move on now. Yeah. We're talking about Atlantis. So, uh, And speaking... And, uh, again, I wish that there had been less of the uh, two scientists in the lab and more of the Atlantean story. Yeah, it's, it's one of those, again, you sort of look at it and it's like, well, this could have been two stories, you know? One of the Master and Unit and stuff like that, and then another, still the Master, but in Atlantis, it's like, we could have gone like another episode or two just because they introduced this, so, this whole Atlantean storyline. Yeah. So, um, but we also got the Minotaur, or the Minotaur, as they say. Um, uh, and that was interesting. It, it was, I mean, it was a guy in uh in a you know mask but it it worked convincingly enough yeah. and at least you know the guy was big enough you know when he's running after joe like he's big enough and she's small enough that it kind of works yeah. um and then it was funny when the doctor used his you know cape now, i can't remember where i saw this or, or read this but would you do the cast list here because i think there's a surprise about the minotaur I wonder if it's what I'm thinking. Again, George Cormack as Delius. Wonderful. Yes. Oh, okay. It was David Prowse. <laughs> well, see, I was sitting here like, you know, they could easily get away with uh, Benton. It's not like he was doing anything in yeah. that episode anyway. It's like, you could you could probably get away with him in that mask. But yeah, okay, so it was... It was Darth Vader. Wow, all right. <laughs> yeah, and I can't remember where I saw that, but huh. uh, somebody said this was like one of his one of his pre-Star Wars roles. Uh, but again, you know, he was only on for what, two minutes. Right, right, so... But interesting, he's just called Dave in this one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it works. He, he's still big and imposing just yeah. as he is as Darth Vader. I think maybe 
it might have been slightly he might have been slightly more uh, imposing if it was if he was playing off of Patrick Troughton who is much smaller than yeah. John Pertwee. John Pertwee, he's a tall man, he's kind of built, you know, so uh so maybe there was that. But oh, overall, it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. Not not complaining about it at all. So Yeah, again, the only problem I had with this story was the flapping bird. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, it was kind of uh, a fun uh, story between the uh, the scientist, the doctor, the female doctor, and her assistant there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, Crassus and uh, Dalios, uh, both very good old actors, loved Ingrid Pitt as as Galea. You know, so it was a great story. It's just that that's you look at that flapping bird and go, as yeah. the director or even as the art director, don't force the audience to look at a flapping bird. Let them see, you know, a claw or a wing, but never let them see the whole thing because that you just look at it and go, Oh, that doesn't fit the rest of it. Yeah. Everything else is so perfect that does not work. Or put some color in it. Like the fact that it's completely stark white yeah. might also be a problem. It makes it look a bit more fake. Like if you added different colors, maybe he slightly had a Atlantean tunic, but it was also sort of, you know, maybe organic looking and i don't know how fast they needed to create this or anything like that but it's like if you had put more detail into it it could have also worked yeah. you know make it look more like a bird and less like a guy with a towel on his head uh and and again thinking from the the standpoint uh, not specifically of the writer but uh, atlantis is the you know the king their uh, protector god is poseidon so why not use a sea serpent, you know. Why not use any kind of, you know, octopus, you know, kraken, whatever you want to call it, uh, instead of because a bird and Poseidon does not seem to to match. You know, find some other aquatic, scary thing yeah. rather than a bird. It it slightly reminds me, and this is obviously not uh, it connected at all, really. But um, in one of the Legend of Zelda games, they have they have this species called the Zora, which are basically just fish people, and eventually. Uh, ironically, there's a game where the entire world is flooded, but there's no more of the the fish people. They have now evolved into bird people. And obviously, this was in, you know, the, the 90s and the early 2000s, so there's no possible connection to this. But unless there's some missing connection between birds and fish that we are just not aware of, <laughs> that the creators of Doctor Who and The Legend of Zelda know about, but I don't think so. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the last couple things I wrote down. First is the the revolution that the master did, just completely taking over. Um, although it didn't last as long as uh, he had hoped. Yeah. So, and again, there was a, a nice little thing there when uh, Galea realized that she had been lied to. I mean, she she told the guards to arrest the master, but would have been even better if she had like you know grabbed one of the swords or something and and literally stabbed him herself even though she didn't have to kill him but just say you know yeah. you have you know toyed with me too long because she's obviously you know based on a character like Hippolyta who was queen queen of the Amazons but just to herself take on the master and you know choke him or slap him around a little bit that would have been kind of fun yeah um we also had the story of the hermit which was interesting from the doctor's childhood I yeah. guess never heard about the doctor's childhood before no not really I mean this is sort of the the first thing we've ever heard that the house that was uh, halfway up a mountain and stuff uh which it, it's a very interesting story as well and you know how it relates to the flower and you know seeing the world you know in a different way and stuff is a very interesting story and yeah i am trying to think of like how it relates to uh you know the doctor's story as a whole because this is sort of the first one of the first things along with just the fact that uh they they pretty much said that he went to uh the academy with the master so, uh, just small little snippets of the Doctor's past, which yeah. are interesting. Um, there's another one later on with uh, David Tennant, and uh, he's talking to uh, the Master, and the Master is saying, you remember all the fields uh, that my father owned, and we would go and play there for hours and stuff, and it's, it's always interesting to hear about that stuff, to sort of think about what was the Doctor's childhood like, you know? And this, you know presumably without getting into uh more recent stuff about the doctor's past um it's interesting to think of so that would be a younger version 
of Hartnell as well. Yeah. So it's just that sort of, I think, 400 years before the events of Doctor Who take place from when he's born to when uh, an unearthly child starts, just what happened in all of that time. Yeah. Because also the fact that when we first meet the Doctor on in, in an earthly child, he's kind of already you know, old and retired and everything. It's like, it seems like he already served as a time Lord and now he's just sort of retired. And now he's, I don't know, maybe it's a midlife crisis of him (laughs) going and stealing a TARDIS and everything. But yeah, it's just very interesting to sort of piece tiny things together. So, uh, and of course I know there are a lot of people that have seen, uh, the more recent seasons of doctor who, who will say, well, this has all been, you know, dumped into a trash fire by recent events. I still don't think it has, but you're entitled to your opinion, so... That, I haven't seen it, so... I, yeah. I don't know. It, It's not really as bad as everyone thinks, so... Yeah. Uh, we'll get there, eventually. Eventually! I mean, yeah, you know, they, they, they reveal big stuff in Series 12 of Modern Doctor Who, and we're on Season 9 of Classic Doctor Who, so, you know, 10 years or so, you'll get there, <laughs> so... Um... Well, sort of the last thing I wrote down was uh, the time ram, which was interesting. Um, And it just sort of how it all worked out of, well, luckily we've been put on the boundary of Kronos's world or whatever. I mentioned, yeah. Yeah. And then we meet the true Kronos, uh, which was interesting and trippy at the same time. Um, But yeah, that, that was really interesting. And it is also interesting well first off the whole thing of like uh well the master he will be tormented he will be tortured for all the pain he has caused and it's like oh geez so they're gonna have to really come up with a way of him getting out of that but then it's like well the doctor bargained for his freedom and everything it's like okay that's a very simple way of you know letting the master go um it still seems strange though that uh that chronos would just be like oh well you said freedom so there there he goes oh well yeah you didn't say it right, I guess. So, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, the master will go off to uh, do, I think, at least one more story. Uh, so, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, when that comes around, yeah. and then how they'll eventually bring him back as the the gooey master. <laughs> but we'll get there when we get there. Uh, you got anything else about this episode? Nothing. No, it was uh, again except for the uh, flappy bird. Yeah, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, especially the last two episodes. Yeah, again, because again, the BBC that is their strength. They they've done so much good stuff over the last uh, however long they've been on the air since the early fifties, I imagine. Yeah. So, and speaking of gooey creatures, uh, next time we have the three doctors with the pizza the hut looking dudes, <laughs> if you recall. So. Oh yes, the the singularly most incredibly silly. Uh, villain monster type things uh, that we have seen so far, if I recall correctly. Yeah, they... They make the Flappy Bird look scary. Yeah, they, they, they were pretty rough. Uh, but yeah, next week we will be re-watching uh, The Three Doctors, and we'll also be watching a modern Doctor Who episode, of which I have not made a choice. We'll find out. So, yeah. Um, but that is basically it. With all that being said, we're Alex and Dad from 7th Hour Films, and we will see you guys next time. All right, guys, thanks for watching this video. There's a bunch of links on screen if you want to go click around to any of those. There's a playlist for all of our classic Doctor Who reactions, as well as another playlist for another Doctor Who series that's on the channel. There's also a subscribe button and a Patreon button on screen, as well as other links in the description if you want to go check out any of those. See you guys later.